Institute. Welcome to the first of our academic seminars or webinars for this new academic year. Before I introduce our speaker and start the webinar, let me just remind you that this event is recorded. And when you raise a question or uh, make a comment, please use the Q&A box. If you would like to stay anonymous, you are welcomed to do so. Um, but it would be helpful for, for me to know who you are so that I will be able to pitch the questions better to the uh, speaker. But if you say at the start of your Q&A that you would like to stay anonymous, I will not read out your name or your affiliations. So your identity will not be viewed. For this webinar, I'm delighted that today I have an absolutely fantastic uh, speaker to kick off our program. And he is, of course, Mingxing Pei. Mingxing is the Tom and Margot Prisker 72 Professor of Government at the Claremont McKenna College in California. Is also a non resident senior fellow of the German Marshall Fund of the United States. He held the inaugural Library of Congress Chair on US China relations in 2019. And before he joined Clement McKenna, he was a senior associate at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and was his director of China program from 2003 to 2008. Before that, he was he taught at Princeton University. Mingxing is a highly respected scholar and public intellectual on China. He is the author of four very highly regarded books. And they are from reform to revolution, the demise of communism in China and the Soviet Union, China's trapped transition, the limits of developmental autocracy, China's crony capitalism, the dynamics of regime decay. And most recently, and the book is also the subject of his talk at this webinar, and it is The Sentinel Stay, Surveillance and the Survival of Dictatorship in China. Over to you, Professor Pei. Okay. Thank you very much, Steve, for this very kind introduction. It's great to join you uh, for this webinar from California. Uh, I also would like to uh, uh, thank the audience for taking the time to hear uh, my thoughts on China's surveillance state. Uh, so as a way of introducing how I got into this project, uh, I want to mention two things. One is that uh, this project started in 2016, shortly after I finished my uh, book on crony capitalism in China. At that time, I had a sense that China's economy was not going to do well, and how could the Communist Party continue to keep its grip on power? And I said, well, that had to be repression, uh, because that's what dictatorships do. They rely on repression to stay in power. That's uh, the last result of, in most cases, first result. Uh, then the second uh, motivation for writing the book was that in the last few years, we've heard a lot about China's use of high technology 
in uh, monitoring the activities and movements of its people. Uh, and that piques my interest as well, uh, because to write a book on repression is too big because repression concerns a wide range of activities. But to write a book on surveillance is much more manageable uh, because surveillance does not include other, it's a very specific kind of repression. Um, so I said, well, let's just uh, see what the surveillance system is like. Uh, I started this project with a lot of skepticism about the use of technology uh, because uh, 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 technology has its limits. Uh, there are a lot of blind spots technology cannot reach. So how can a regime so confidently rely on technology to make sure that its enemies are not going to do something against the regime? So that is uh, one doubt, The one source of doubt. The other doubt comes from my own knowledge of how the Chinese system works, because China had a very effective surveillance state uh, state or system long before China had acquired fancy technology. So technology can only be part of the story, not the whole story. So this, so these two uh, factors led me to write this book. So the theoretical question is really about how dictatorships conduct preventive repression. Dictatorships rely on repression, but there are two kinds of repression. One is what you might call reactive or responsive reaction. That is, you to adopt repressive measures only after an activity, undesirable or dangerous activity has occurred. Uh, the best example is Tiananmen. You have mass demonstrations. Then you have to send in tanks, troops to crush it. That's reactive repression. The problem with reactive repression is that it is very costly uh, in terms of lives lost, reputational damages, and also uh, to the survival of the regime itself. What if uh, hard repression or reactive repression does not work? So, re so more sophisticated regimes engage in second kind of repression, and that is preventive repression. You try to prevent an undesirable activity from taking place. And the only way you do this is to maintain a very effective system of surveillance. You get the information, divide the intentions, and then take preventive measures. Uh, so that is ex ante repression. Uh, this is what surveillance is all about. Surveillance is preventive repression. Uh, so preventive repression is on the whole much more desirable for a dictatorship, but there are three problems for any dictatorship that tries to rely on preventive repression instead of reactive repression. The first problem is the so-called coercive dilemma. That is, if you have to build an effective surveillance system, you have to build a very powerful spying, a domestic spying agency, the secret police. Um, and the dilemma here is that if you build a very powerful secret police, then the political bosses might not be able to control it. So the secret police itself could be a source of threat to the regime. So that is, the, so the first challenge is how do you design a system that does its job without having the system becoming a threat to the regime itself. The second problem for preventive repression is that it is not cheap. Uh, preventive repression requires the building and maintenance of a very large network of agents, informers, uh, and the use of equipment. This is a, particularly a problem for dictatorships because most dictatorships are poor or low or middle income countries. They simply do not have the resource. So the second problem is the resource constraint. And the third problem is that preventive repression, uh, operationally speaking, is quite sophisticated. 
because it involves a lot of coordination. It involves the adoption of sophisticated techniques, tactics as well. So how do you achieve operational effectiveness? So these three challenges means that in most dictatorships, it is actually pretty hard to maintain effective surveillance. It is easily more easily said than done. Uh, so this is the sort of theoretical uh, 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 focus of the book, even though the book's main contribution is very empirical, that it, it allows, it uh, maps China's surveillance apparatus. And through this mapping exercise, we understand how the Chinese Communist Party successfully confronted and solved the three challenges. Uh, so the outline of this presentation uh, is follows. First, I describe the organization of China's surveillance system. Uh, and second, I look at how intelligence in this system is collected, mostly through informants. Third, I uh, describe the scope of the surveillance in, uh, who are monitored in China. And finally, I talk a little bit about the use of technology. Uh, the challenge for researchers in, this, in trying to understand how China's surveillance system works is mostly empirical because the, the information, the data are not accessible. Uh, if you go to China and try to interview the people in their system, probably you're not going to be very successful. Uh, even, and that assumes that if you can actually get out of China after trying this exercise, because that involves trying to gain access to state secrets. Uh, so uh, and a lot of the information is classified. So that is a real challenge. But China is a huge country. China has a lot of bureaucracies, jurisdictions that have to report their annual activities. So I rely mostly on these sources, uh, local gazettes. Uh, these are local histories that describe, among other things, local law enforcement activities. So you can gain insights, uh, materials, uh, from these sources. Another source is specialized gazettes. They're called local police gazettes. These are history books of local public security bureaus, and they are ver veritably gold mine uh, in this exercise. And third is uh, local uh, government yearbooks. Every county, city, province uh, has to report a and uh, uh, has to publish an annual uh, report. Uh, that's the uh, yearbooks. Uh, and uh, uh, there are sections in there dealing with local law enforcement activities. University yearbooks, also quite useful if you um, want to understand how surveillance is conducted on university campuses. Uh, all you need to do is to go to these yearbooks. And finally, police academy textbooks, because they explain certain key operational concepts and uh, reveal some policing tactics. So altogether, these five sources constitute the main database uh, from empirical database from which uh, the book is uh, uh, based on. Uh, so I encourage you uh, to uh, uh, sort of cast a wide net in the future if you want to uh, work on China, as we know, uh, studying China these days is increasingly difficult, uh, but uh, uh, there are still ways uh, uh, that uh, that will allow you to uh, gain sources. So now let me just uh, uh, first uh, talk about the evolution of the surveillance state. Uh, the Communist Party established a labor-intensive but poorly resourced surveillance state as soon as it came into power uh, in 1949. Uh, it, the organizational and institutional components of the existing surveillance state uh, were established in the 1950s. So what were 
those. Uh, first is reliance on the masses. So the mass campaigns uh, that mobilized the people to carry out uh, first a terror campaign against the enemies of the state, uh, and then second, to organize local security groups. So that is the uh, the math, the so-called mass line in Communist Party low, uh, uh, the slow, uh, slogan uh, or uh, lexicon. Uh, and second, they quickly established a secret police agency inside the Public Security Bureau. It's the Bureau Number One, still called Bureau Number One uh, in the Public Security Ministry. Uh, at the time, the title was Pol Political Security Protection. Later, it, in the 1990s, it was changed to Domestic Security Protection. Under Xi Jinping, it was changed back to Political Security Protection, reflecting uh, uh, his uh, conception of domestic security. Uh, and third, that the regime, uh, the third component was the network of informants and, and spies. Uh, uh, or civilians, you might call civilian uh, spies and informants. Uh, and lastly, they established a central leading group overseeing domestic security uh, called Central uh, Politics and Legal uh, Leading Group. Today, uh, that is the predecessor of the Central Commission, Central League, Political and Legal Commission today. So uh, from the outset, the framework of today's surveillance state was already uh, in place. Uh, in the uh, pre-cultural revolution era, that is 1949 to, uh, to uh, 1966, and until uh, I was say, uh, uh, until the end of the Maoist era. So in the Maoist era, the main targets were class enemies, the so-called four category elements, uh, landlords, rich peasants, uh, uh, counter-revolutionaries, and bad elements. These were the four category elements. That's the, the only well-established, well-effectively maintained, but very large surveillance program. Altogether, the Communist Party, official sources uh, uh, claims, claims that about 20 million people were in that program or were classified as four category elements. Uh, when I look at, well, this number is useful, but it does not mean that much <laughs> because we don't know the percentage of the population because uh, they label somebody as a 40 four category element today, but they label that person tomorrow. So there's a lot of churn in that program. So by looking at 13, 14 provincial yearbooks, I managed to uh, reach this estimate. The program covers roughly about 1.6% of the Chinese population at that time, uh, because the population kept growing. So by the end of the Maoist era, we're talking about roughly 10 million people in that program in any given year. Uh, and uh, uh, one program which is uh, maintained today was established in the late 50s. It's called a Key Populations Program that was maintained by the police. But that program was quite different. And by my judgment, it was not very effective because that program was very labor intensive. It uh, uh, relied not on the masses, because the four categories program was mainly implemented by volunteers. Uh, so it did not cost the state much, but the key populations program relied on the police. And China in those days had a relatively small police force. And even more importantly, this program relied on the Hukou system, household registration system, which was very poorly developed in the uh, Maoist era. The Hukou, Hukou system was perfected only in the post-Mao era. I think this is something most people don't realize because Hukou system involved a lot of paperwork. I think uh, in the, the pre-Mao uh, 
uh, in the Maoist era, uh, yeah, uh, because of political disruptions and uh, uh, lack of resources, uh, the, the hukou system was not very effective. So as a result, the key populations program was not very effective. Uh, so the Maoist era, we can so reach these conclusions. A, as I said, the framework was established. B, it was quite weak because of the lack of resources. Uh, three, uh, third is that Maoism, Maoism was the worst enemy of China's surveillance state. This may come as a surprise because the surveillance state is almost by definition a highly institutionalized, highly organized system. And Maoism was anything but. Uh, on the Mao, there were two events that really devastated China's surveillance state. One was the Great Leap Forward. The Great Leap Forward was such an economic disaster that after the Great Leap Forward, the Communist Party had to downsize the police force. Uh, you could see this uh, from uh, the uh, dramatic reduction of uh, the size of the police in the wake of the Great Leap Forward. Uh, the other uh, disaster was the Cultural Revolution. That was mainly a political disaster because during that period, 10 year period, the early part of the, I think the first uh, seven years, they dismantled the spying network. So they, for a while, China actually had no informers because the informer, that network was banned by the radicals. And uh, second, the police force uh, suffered a huge shock. Uh, their files were lost. A lot of police lost their jobs. A lot of senior officials were persecuted. Uh, and the police really did not recover un uh, until the 1980s. So the master era in terms of China's, the development of China's surveillance state was a very mixed picture. Uh, it laid the foundations, but then on top of that, uh, uh, you did not really have much. The restoration project was carried out in nine, in the 1980s when uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping began to uh, rebuild the surveillance apparatus. But interestingly, in the 1980s, we did not see a very effective Chinese surveillance state, judging by the fact that the 1980s was a decade of relative political openness, relative of a uh, relative uh, uh, a high degree of uh, civil liberties and uh, constant uh, eruptions of pro-democracy activities and movements. So I, uh, judging by these fact, uh, facts, my conclusion is that the surveillance state did not, did not do a good job. Of course, when you look at Tiananmen, obviously uh, preventive re repression was either ineffectual or practically non-existent. Uh, I have three uh, interpretations for the 1980s. Uh, one was that, uh, materially speaking, in terms of resources, uh, the uh, post Mao regime was still resource constrained. It simply did not have the uh, funds to build a much more modern, much more well resourced equipment, a uh, uh, resource. Uh, uh, surveillance state. Uh, in going through uh, local police cadets, it's quite interesting when you look at what kind of achievements they were talking about in the 1980s. So if they uh, were given money to buy a camera, that was considered uh, a big deal because <laughs> many police uh, units did not have cameras to take photos of crime scenes. Uh, so that gives you an idea of uh, what and, uh, recently, when I, I was watching the uh, Gate of Heaven and Peace, this really great documentary of Tiananmen, uh, I noticed that uh, there were very few cameras on the streets of Beijing, and the police were using handheld cameras and to show the uh, 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 big uh, some TV cameras to record uh, the uh, uh, the protesters. Uh, so the first was the resource constraint. The second was Deng Xiaoping's obsession with crime. 
Deng Xiaoping, starting in 1983, launched at least two waves of strike hard uh, uh, anti-crime drive. Uh, that led to the arrest of hundreds and thousands of many innocent people, actually. And then the, after these people were released, they became objects of surveillance because uh, uh, they were ex com comments and police have to watch them. So that must have diverted significant police resources. Uh, so that's my second interpretation. The third in interpretation was really uh, at the front line of the Chinese regime, reformers who were in charge, Hu Yaobang, Zhao Ziyang. This did not want the police to get out of control, to get to let the secret police get out of control. So I think these three reasons explain how uh, and why surveillance state failed to prevent the repeated pro-democracy challenges in the 1980s. Uh, so what we see today in China in terms of the surveillance state is really the product of the post Tiananmen era. In the post Tiananmen era, uh, now three decades uh, 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 ago, uh, about, about, about three decades after the post Tiananmen era, the Communist Party invested a huge amount of resources in the surveillance state, uh, thanks to the huge economic boom uh, during most of this era, uh, the party no longer had resource constraint. So it could afford to uh, uh, invest in manpower equipment. This you can see from the massive increase in, domest in the domestic security budget. Uh, between uh, 1991 and 2020, uh, China's domestic security budget uh, rose 24 times in real terms. Uh, this is a shocking number. Uh, and uh, this funds the police, jails, prosecutors, and, uh, uh, um, and courts. Uh, and uh, they also established uh, uh, to, uh, well, improved and then established two mass surveillance programs. One is the Key Populations Program, which originated in the 1950s, late 1950s, but really uh, take off, did not take off during the Mao era. But in the, starting in the mid-1980s, this program was continuously improved and now uh, is uh, one of the two pillars of this mass surveillance program. Uh, the other was the Key individuals program that came relatively late. I think that emerged only in uh, the early part of the century. Uh, and that uh, covers a lot more people. I'll, I'll talk about this. Uh, and the technological development, this is a third element, uh, is um, uh, uh, that development began in the late 1990s. Uh, and then uh, was continuously upgraded. Uh, so in terms of institutional building, the biggest, the most uh, important uh, achievement uh, was uh, the building of the uh, political legal committees throughout uh, China, uh, because that committee uh, would, organ uh, would coordinate they implement specific surveillance uh, uh, programs. Uh, so that's uh, uh, that's a very quick uh, historical uh, uh, review. Uh, before I talk about its individual components, let me just summarize the four key characteristics of China's surveillance system. Uh, uh, first and most distinctive uh, uh, feature of China's surveillance system is what I would call distributed surveillance. That is, the Chinese system is notable for uh, the decentralization and deconcentration of surveillance uh, uh, of, of potential threats. Uh, the Chinese system assigns different functions to a multitude of organizations and actors uh, it has several layers. Uh, uh, multiple state agencies are involved, even within the police, different units of the police are given 
uh, different tasks. Uh, they have different categories of informants, uh, both security agencies and non-security state agencies are involved. So in other words, this distributed surveillance allows the Chinese Communist Party to successfully address the coercive dilemma. It does not have to concentrate all the tasks of surveillance in one agency. Uh, and I'll explain when I describe the Chinese, uh, the formal Chinese security agency. The second is that uh, China has a top-down coordination system. Uh, uh, and that's the central commission, the central legal and political co uh, commission. Uh, it's uh, the, at every level of the Chinese state, there is such a commission. Uh, no other dictatorship has such a vertically integrated uh, party bureaucracy. Uh, so that's a Chinese invention. And third, surprisingly, uh, you might call it a lean and mean. That is, the formal security agencies of China, in China responsible for surveillance are actually pretty small, if, if you judge by their, their manpower. Uh, bureau number one, uh, the police, a domestic secret police probably number no more than a hundred thousand in the uh, in the country. So give you some kind of idea that is uh, uh, the Stasi in GDR, uh, which does both dom which did both domestic spying and external espionage, had ninety one thousand uh, full time employees, equivalent 06 percent of the population. So even if we so cut that in half. Half of them do ex external ex espionage, half, do, half of them would, uh, did domestic spying. To use that ratio, China's, if China had the same ratio as East Germany, uh, China's bureau number one alone would have 4.2 million <laughs> secret agents. And clearly China, uh, this number is more than China's uh, uniformed police. So that's... Uh, 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 because China relies uh, a lot on informants, not uh, uniformed uh, 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 secret agents. Uh, number four is that China's surveillance tactics are quite well developed and sophisticated. Um, they, uh, uh, in the book, and, uh, uh, I have a, a chapter on uh, how they perfect, they use the concept of battlefield position control. To, mount, to ensure that uh, venues that are likely to pose uh, uh, serious dangers are severe, uh, very heavily monitored. So this is the uh, summarized. And uh, in terms of command and control, I think we need to pay more attention on the uh, Central Political Legal Commission. Uh, work on this, uh, not much attention has been actually paid to this Commission. Uh, uh, I uh, uh, I looked around and <laughs> there was very little scholarship on this. So I think the role of this commission has been overlooked. Uh, what this commission does is actually very simple. Every year, uh, because the commission is headed by uh, uh, used to headed by a uh, a member of the political standing committee, now is a political member. The commission gets its marching orders from uh, the Politburo Senate Committee. And then it convenes a central level meeting in January, usually. And then every uh, province, every city, every county, uh, their political legal committees would meet. They set the targets. They uh, uh, Then they also coordinate the fulfillment of different tasks. So it's really, without this commission, a lot of things in China cannot uh, cannot be done. So in terms of formal security agencies, we are really talking about three. The first is the Ministry of Public Security, the formal police agency. Uh, the unit in this agency responsible for domestic surveillance is Bureau Number One, as I said. It's relatively small, uh, based on local uh, yearbooks. Uh, my estimate is that probably it's about three to five percent of the popular uh, of the uh, uh, of 
the uniformed police. So uh, that's about 60 to 60,000 to 100,000. So it's, uh, China is a huge country, so this is relatively small, but it handles mostly high priority cases. Uh, also within the police, uh, at the local level, there is a uh, uh, the local police stations, this is much larger. It handles lower priority uh, uh, surveillance cases. It focuses mostly on uh, uh, law enforcement duties. And then the third is the Ministry of State Security, MSS. Uh, information on this agency is very scarce, but based on uh, before the end, uh, in the 1990s, uh, local governments actually would report the activities of uh, MSS in their jurisdictions, but not anymore. So you know very little about what uh, was happening with uh, this agency at the local level. But what we know is that, do know, is that this agency is primarily responsible for foreigners or Chinese citizens suspected of having foreign connections. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, it's real. It's quite active on university campuses, largely because of the presence of foreign faculty and foreign students on Chinese. Uh, uh, so, in uh, let me just con so, so conclude this section by so highlighting this feature: the division of labor among China's formal security agencies resembles the U.S. and U.K. much more than the Soviet Union. Because China does not have the equivalent of KGB, China does have the equivalent of MI5 and MI6. Uh, uh, MSS is very equivalent to MI6. Uh, of course, it has some sort of counterintelligence duties of MI5, uh, but so in terms of uh, dealing with domestic threats, uh, Bureau Number One is very similar to uh, MI5. Uh, so that's uh, uh, the one of the backbones is uh, the spying network. Uh, China has a huge spying network. Uh, uh, it has different uh, categories. The police runs a much more elite informers and spies. Uh, we uh, judging by uh, local yearbooks. I uh, it's a, the police. So there are three categories of. Uh, informants. Uh, uh, the, the domestic security protection uh, units, uh, these are domestic secret police, they run so uh, uh, they run spies, they call it special intelligence personnel. Uh, they are mostly recruited by the police to penetrate hostile groups uh, and gain access to uh, important suspects. Um, the number based on one province, Sanxi province, uh, is that probably they have about half a million such agents in China. So not, uh, it's large, but not some, the largest category uh, in China. Uh, and they are assigned three uh, types of uh, res uh, response uh, tasks. Uh, one type is called case spies. These are the people who are given a very specific task. Uh, if the police wants to investigate a certain group or certain individual, they would recruit an informant or informants to infiltrate uh, that group or gain access to a particular individual. And of all the spies they employ, this category accounts for about 10%. Uh, then the second category is this called position control spies. If, uh, because they identify certain venues, a university, a library, a restaurant, uh, or a, 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 say, uh, airports, uh, railway stations, and important venues. So they will recruit sp spies to monitor these venues, not individual but venues. So about 40% of their spies are deployed on those venues. And about then the rest, about 50%, uh, they are categorized as general purpose 
intelligent spies. So these are the people who would collect generic information and report it to their handlers. So that it's the sort of a, uh, uh, the kind the categories of spies use. At the local level, uh, we're talking about police stations. They re recruit a different category of informants. These are called uh, public order informants or zi an er mu. Uh, they're much more numerous. Uh, my calculation is that they probably have about some, uh, a million of those. Uh, that's because uh, each beat cop, local community cop, uh, is required to recruit two or three per year. Uh, so that's uh, uh, the ideal recruits for spies and public order informants are people who can monitor or give a venue, uh, 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 gain access to people's property house, uh, or people who simply can know uh, who is going where. So taxi drivers, for example, are ideal recruits. Delivery personnel, sanitation workers, security guards, apartment custodians, parking lot attendants, shopkeepers in train stations, and uh, uh, newsstand staff. So uh, they uh, uh, a lot of ordinary looking people, they might be working for the police. Uh, now the the third category of informants is called Xin Xi Yuan. Uh, this is the largest group. Uh, they are not recruited by the police. They are recruited by uh, universities, by factories, by uh, neighborhood committees. Uh, so uh, there's a lot more information about this group uh, based on local data. I would say that China has about 10 to 15 million such informants. Uh, so this uh uh incidentally this percentage is, is roughly the same as east germany uh stasi recruited about one percent of the population uh the uh but the numbers do not tell the whole story uh the question is uh of this 10 to 15 million people uh does every one of them actually work for the government uh here my answer is that no but about only 40% of them are active, 60% are not active. And that makes sense because I believe that recruiting informants is a hard target. There is a quota. So local officials have to fulfill their quota. And so when local officials go to somebody and say, would you like to sign up as an informant? Uh, that person probably has to say yes, <laughs> because there are consequences if you say no. But they don't have to uh, actually do anything because whether an informant performs or not, produces information or not, is a soft target. So once the party secretary or local official fulfills the hard target of recruiting somebody, that per, uh, the official does not have to sort of uh, fulfill another target. That is, that person has to deliver information. Uh, and of course, if you sign up for such a sort of a morally dubious duty, uh, reluctantly, uh, of course you're not going to be active. Uh, so if the local official comes around and say, "Look, uh, have you heard anything?" They say, "Well, I've been busy. I don't, I don't know anything. I have not heard anything. Come back later. Probably I know something." So I think this kind of uh, act, uh, behavior. Uh, explains why you have nominally a very uh, large network of informants, but uh, only about so less than half of them are active. But even less than half, it's a lot. It's 4 million to 6 million people. So that's... Uh, 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 nevertheless, I think uh, if you want to talk about deterrence, uh, the very knowledge that your neighbor, colleague, friend uh, could be an informant, does have a deterrent effect. Uh, that explains the lack of trust uh, in China. People simply don't want to talk about politics uh, uh, out of concern for this. So this network, uh, so what does it do? What kind of information it collects? Again, based on local data, 
this network collects very little so, uh, enemy intelligence. There are three kinds of uh, intelligence this network produces. The first kind is called enemy intel. Uh, uh, this category concerns uh, activities, intentions of separatists, terrorists, uh, uh, dissidents, uh, and uh, cult members of evil cults, only 3% of all intelligence. It, it makes sense because most of these people uh, are not close to those political suspects. Uh, so they really cannot produce a lot. And of course, given the lack of trust in Chinese society, you're not going to talk to people uh, uh, so very... Uh, but, uh, people whom you don't trust about your politics. So that's so most of the uh, intelligence is about sort of social intelligence, societal intelligence. Uh, that is, what is going on in society? Are they talking about inflation, unemployment, joblessness? So that is social intelligence. That's about seventy five percent, and then about twenty percent covers so called political intelligence. Intelligence that is public reaction to government policies, to leadership, to international events. So today, uh, I'm sure uh, uh, political intelligence will cover what are people talking about the war in Ukraine? What are people talking about Xi Jinping? So that's uh, so. In other words, this network serves as some sort of sounding board uh, for the Chinese. Uh, 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 le leadership. Uh, lastly, most of the intelligence collected by this uh, vast network is not very high quality. Only about a quarter of all the intelligence collected is reported to superior officials, uh, which means that about 75% is considered uh, useless. So there's a mixed picture about China's informants. A, it's very large. B, it's not very you know, sort of uh, productive in terms of uh, the productivity of individual informants as well as the quality of uh, the intelligence. However, it does have deterring effect because it uh, prevents people from engaging in collective action. Uh, and uh, B, it uh, also helps the Communist Party gain a source of independence probably cannot get from uh, the, its official channels. So now uh, let me deal with the next to the last issue. So the scope of surveillance, uh, that is what, how many people, what kind of people uh, is this system actually watching? Because the system, what we know the system watches two things, people and venues. So, uh, the people. Okay, so they have two programs. One I've already mentioned, the key populations program. It is run by the police. It is very cumbersome. Uh, if you uh, Google in 重点人口信息采列表, that is information uh, uh, entry form for key populations online, you will see just it's lots of categories. Uh, it's maintained by the police. It's extremely time-consuming. Uh, it began in the 1980s. Uh, most of the people in this program are ex-cons. Political suspects, only about 2 to 3%. Uh, and altogether, about 5 million Chinese citizens, 0.35%, uh, are in this program. So it's a it's a large program, uh, but it's mostly for law enforcement purposes. The second program, it's called Key Individuals Program, This is a much larger program, and it covers a lot more political uh, suspects. Now, it is not maintained by the police, but maintained by local governments. I have not found conclusive evidence about what particular agency maintains this program. But my uh, 
uh, instinct tells me that it has to be the local political legal committee. Uh, and uh, uh, it must be designated by individual government uh, units, such as a local part, uh, a local neighborhood committee, a university, or a state-owned enterprises. Uh, and it is much larger than the key populations program. Uh, again, based on local data, it's about 15% to 50% larger. So that means that we have about six to eight million people in this program, key individuals. So key populations and key individuals together, we're talking about 11 to 30 million Chinese people, 0.75% uh, to 0.9% uh, of the Chinese population on two black lists, effectively. Uh, there are not, uh, so the, these two lists, there are national databases uh, uh, on which these two lists are, are stored. So if, uh, say, I, I live in California, I go to Washington, D.C., uh, the police in Washington, D.C. can type in my national ID and they, they will access the information. So it's a national uh, the information of the people, uh, on the people on these two lists is nationally available for police. And the key individuals program covers more political suspects. Uh, we don't know the shit uh, because they just don't, do not break it down. But from descriptive uh, uh, information, we know that these people are much more likely to be on key individuals program. Uh, called stability-related key individuals. So who are these? These are uh, former PLA soldiers uh, who want to demonstrate for more benefits, uh, e uh, members of cults, underground religious groups, ethnic minorities, and repeat petitioners. Uh, so this is a much more political program than uh, the key individuals program. Now, uh, finally, let me talk about high-tech surveillance. Uh, as I uh, alluded to earlier, uh, this the high surveillance program emerged only in the late 1990s. Uh, the first program was Golden Shield. This is the informal, informatization modernization program because until the late, late 1990s, the Chinese uh, police agencies really did not have a modern data management system or even secure communication. And the internet was emerging. So the Golden Shield project, which has been continuously upgraded, uh, uh, is really a data management they, uh, uh, system. So it, has, it's the, it allows the Chinese uh, secure, security apparatuses to uh, have secure communications, modernized, digitized data management system. Uh, and incidentally, this is a system that Golden Shield Project is where the Great Firewall of China uh, is located. Uh, then they move on to visual surveillance uh, in uh, the first decade of this century. Um, the, uh, uh, then that's Skynet. Uh, uh, pilot project was launched in 2004. It's run exclusively by the Ministry of Public Security. Uh, initially, it, uh, it's, uh, it was centered on visual surveillance and so, so smart sensors and located only in the cities. And uh, it's been just constantly modernized as well. Uh, now it's equipped with uh, AI, facial recognition, and smart sensors. And most importantly, this system allows the Chinese police to track your mobile phones. Mobile phones have become the most valuable targets for Chinese police to track. Uh, and uh, third uh, uh, project is Sharp Eyes. Uh, this uh, was implemented in 
20, around 2015, it was not run by the police. It was run by local uh, political legal committees. It's an expansion, it's an expansion of Skynet to the countryside and to areas in Chinese cities where Skynet did not reach. It, uh, so these are some three main survey, well-established surveillance programs altogether. Uh, they allowed the Chinese police to have constant visual surveillance, uh, uh, data effective data management. Uh, now, uh, people hear a lot about social credit. This is still a, a work in progress. Uh, we uh, do not know uh, a whole lot about it. Uh, I guess it would just take a, a lot longer than most people assume uh, for this program to become mature and effective. Uh, so that's the uh, uh, last one. Uh, okay, let me just uh, uh, conclude by uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, listing the four takeaways. That is, effective state of surveillance depends on four factors. Political priority of the regime, its organizational capacity, its fiscal resources, and its technological capabilities. China acquired all of them only in the last 20 years. So the Chinese system is relatively new. And second, uh, an effective system requires both labor intensive and technological intensive capabilities. Uh, technology complements, but does not substitute or replace labor intensive surveillance. The Chinese system is effective because it uses both. Uh, and third is that we often uh, wonder how economic development in China has not really uh, uh, led to uh, mo uh, democracy. Right? Uh, uh, one explanation is that uh, at least for a while, economic development can generate the resources that would allow a Leninist regime or dictatorship to beef up surveillance. So uh, you have more surveillance capabilities and that can offset uh, the demand or the forces for democracy. And lastly, I think theoretically speaking, uh, we often observe that one party regimes are more durable or more resilient, quote unquote, than other types of dictatorships. And my research shows, uh, reviews one plausible answer to this puzzle. That is, uh, these regimes uh, possess uh, greater, far greater organizational capabilities than other types of dictatorships. And such capabilities translate into greater capacity for preventive repression, uh, thereby prolonging the longevity of these regimes. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Ming Sing, Professor Pei, for this absolutely fantastically interesting and uh, informative presentation. Um, let me encourage people to put their questions in the Q&A box. Uh, if you would not like your name to be mentioned, um, just say that at the beginning, but still tell me who you are so that I can see whether um, I will give you priority. There are certain categories of people that I would actually give priority to. Um, before I pick on some of the questions already in the Q&A box. Let me kick off by asking you, uh, Professor Bayes, this obvious question that somebody looking at this subject would want you to know. Because there has been quite a bit of hype about the capability, technical capabilities of the Chinese surveillance state, particularly the use of new technologies like facial recognition generating a kind of image that China was cutting edge in that department, partly because of the large database they have and the less restrictive use of such technology. Have you come across anything that would suggest to you the Chinese are in fact genuinely ahead compared to say the US or UK or other European countries 
in the use of such technologies like facial recognition? Yeah, uh, I think not in my book, but I've seen research that shows that China is ahead in that particular area, uh, facial recognition, uh, the, use, uh, the use of AI. So Chinese facial recognition technology is much more advanced, more accurate than uh, Western counterparts. Uh, and that's because uh, it deployed it early, it constantly refines because of the political uh, imperative behind it. Um, so that's, uh, 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 I stand to be corrected, but if you Google, probably you will, if you do some research, probably I think China is, uh, is ahead of uh, other countries in facial recognition technology. Thank you. Um, first question I pick comes from Francis Wood. And she would like to ask you whether there are difficulties for coordinations amongst the many different agencies involved in the surveillance state. Yeah, I uh, I think that uh, has to be because coordination is uh, uh, is uh, very very difficult across different departments. But when you have uh, a party bureaucracy uh, that is in charge of particular security task, uh, with that agency, probably you do a much better job than without that agency. Uh, uh, again, my research shows that certain activities they do really well. That is around a given date. For example, June 4th, uh, the uh, convening of the annual uh, conference of uh, the annual uh, sessions of the National People's Congress uh, and the convening of the Party Congress because on these special occasions, uh, the entire system was mobilized and coordination work was done really well. Other things I'm not so sure. Uh, for example, if they want to have all the cameras built, are they going to have the cameras built on this particular date, installed on this particular date or two weeks later? So these are less priority tasks. So my, uh, so the most confident answer I have is that coordination is much better when the political priority is higher and coordination is less uh, good where there is less political priority attached to a given task. Okay, um, next question I pick come from a SOAS postgraduate student, Helene Bode. Is there a shift in surveillance tactics since Xi Jinping came to power. Can, have we seen any new approach being practiced by him or ordered by him? Yeah, I think, you know, because uh, a lot of the data uh, cover in, in the book cover the pre-Xi era, not that much. But again, uh, based on my recollection, this is what I think is happening on the Xi. One is an expansion of the technological surveillance state. Skynet was implemented on the Xi Jinping. So that's expansion. And B, there was an upgrading of at least the ambitions that a social, social credit scheme was conceived and went into experimental stage on the Xi Jinping. And third, there's uh, one part of the system I did not talk about, it's a grid management. That is a combination of labor intensive uh, approach and a tech intensive approach. And that also became a very important component. Uh, well, that received a big push on the Xi Jinping. So in other words, we've seen at least uh, an effort to make the system much bigger, much more 
advanced on the Xi Jinping. Next question comes from Chou Kuang, whom you know. Yeah. And the question I is, have... do you know what kind of reactions your book is receiving within the governing circles in China? And there is, of course, and in quotation marks, official response. There yeah. is another response that is perhaps more behind the scenes and not make public. What yeah. do you think the Chinese government might do on surveillance after reading your book and absorbing yeah. the lessons that you have yeah. provided? I think, I wish I, uh, I knew I have not been back <laughs> since February, uh, since the book was published. Uh, so I, this is what I would guess. Um, the first reaction, uh, the, the, there are some, depend, it really depends on who you are. Okay? If you are a Chinese academic, a Chinese, uh, uh, or even a, a Chinese academic, the reaction is, oh my gosh, how come we could not write such a book? <laughs> so this is uh, the, how can this guy based in Claremont, California, beat us to it. So that's the one. I think a senior official in the Chinese government uh, say, uh, say, yeah, it makes all sense. We did not think about it, it actually, <laughs> that the book captures the essence of uh, it makes uh, more sense than we know. Uh, and third reaction would be, what are the loopholes the book has identified uh, uh, in our system. Uh, so they might say, well, how come 60% uh, of our informants are not very active? We have to address that issue. How come can we improve the quality of the information? And also they would be uh, very unhappy with the amount of information leaking through the system. So how come they, those jurisdictions uh, uh, accidentally put sensitive information in the annual reports. We have to rectify that. So I guess these are the four different types of reactions uh, that might exist in China. Okay. Next question from Carlos Torres. Doesn't this de deterrent feature have some grim consequences, particularly upon social relationship. At the end of the day, Carlos feels that it is better for a government that people will trust each other rather than mistrust each other, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's that's what we think. <laughs> but you have to put your uh, you have to appreciate the mindset of a dictatorship. A dictatorship as chances for survival are previously impaired when people start trusting each other because higher levels of social trust are translated into higher probability of collective action. That is, people can actually get together and uh, uh, join in protest, join in resistance, join in defiance against an autocratic authority. So from a dictatorship's point of view, the less social trust in the society, the easier for them to govern. So that is, of course, it comes with a huge economic cost. Uh, but if you ask a dictatorship, would you rather lose power in a prosperous society or keep power in a poor society? The answer is obvious. They will choose the latter uh, all the time. And that's why we have a lot of dictatorships ruling poor countries today. Okay. Um, next questions. I'm combining two questions from two different uh, persons for you. Um, the persons, persons are Ali Alavi and an anonymous uh, participant. Ali would like to ask you the question of China's external surveillance operations. 
he says China has interests in other parts of the world. How does China receive information from abroad? Has China developed a strong external intelligence service? And the anonymous, anonymous uh, participant would like to ask you more specifically about what happens to people who are being targeted by the Chinese intelligence in places like Australia, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, etc. Yeah, uh, let me start by saying that there is very little public information on Chinese intelligence or surveillance activities abroad. Uh, it's super sensitive, so they are not going to disclose it. So as a serious scholar, that makes it very difficult for us to study. So now what you do is that you uh, hear a lot uh, from the media. Uh, I tend to have a relatively low opinion of even mainstream media on reporting these things because it's quite sensational uh, and uh, there's no follow-up. Uh, the end results probably are very different from the initial reporting. So, uh, But just based on, again, my uh, research on how the domestic intelligence or surveillance networks function, uh, I can say with a high degree of confidence that whatever China has outside its borders, it's much less effective, much less well-established, much less broad in scope than what it has at home because the Technology is a huge problem. You, you go there, you're subject to the jurisdictions of sovereign states. Uh, you don't even have control over their communications network. Uh, of course, you can try to uh, borrow, you try to infiltrate, but the priority is not really a few Chinese dissidents abroad. They're much more interested in military technological secrets. So they're not going to uh, misallocate resources. And in terms of human intelligence, uh, people who live outside China are largely outside of the control of the Chinese government. So the Chinese government does not have leverage over them. Probably it has leverage over a few, but not over a very large number of people. So uh, uh, I would say this, the system is has to be smaller, less ex uh, sophisticated, less expensive. Uh, so the uh, less effective. And uh, so as to sort of what happens to people, uh, so far, I think we've, uh, China and Russia do do different things. We've not seen a confirmed case of assassination <laughs> by uh, Chinese intelligence agents. They just don't do this. Unlike Russia, Russia has carried out assassinations. Uh, I think what they do is they try to, well, we've, we've heard that they try to use intimidation, use uh, uh, infiltration. Uh, but other than that, it's sort of pretty low-grade stuff. Okay, next question comes from Olivia Jung. You have mapped a surveillance apparatus that is directed towards the people. To what extent does it overlap with the party's internal surveillance apparatus? No. Are, key difference, are there key differences and similar, similarity? Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Olivia. I wish I know the answer because uh, uh, I uh, uh, I don't think that sort of a, uh, the party maintains a separate system because it's... Uh, uh, if it does, we would have known about this uh, because of the sheer size of the party. Uh, uh, if the party had such a system, it would be a hierarchical top-down system with a lot of involvement, people involved. So far, we've not heard anything. So I think it does not exist. But this does not mean that the party does not rely on technical means to monitor its uh, uh, officials. And it does not, uh, the party, I would say the party relies mostly on two things. 
to make sure that uh, uh, it deals with the so-called insider threat, political threat. Uh, one is communications uh, 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 surveillance. I've heard that if you are a senior, if you're official in the party, you're not supposed to turn off your mobile phone. <laughs> so that, that means that the party actually knows where you are at any given moment. And it can also tell who you are with at any given moment. And of course, they eavesdrop you, uh, drop eavesdrop on you, right? So that's uh, uh, so communication, that's the key. The other is the party has strict rules um, internal ac political activities. You're not supposed to form cliques, engage in uh, political activities not sanctioned by the party. So I think these two things allow the party to deal with insider threats. Okay, next question is a follow up to one of your earlier answers about overseas operations. And it comes from Michelle Ship Shipworth. Uh, you, you said that there was not much surveillance of Chinese abroad. What about CSSAs? Were they not used for this purpose? Yeah, well, it's a uh, we're talking about so Chinese students uh activists. They are uh I think this performed two functions. The most important function is to generate political support for the Chinese government. So if Xi Jinping comes to London, they rally the students this, to every student uh, union and say, well, you have to send 100 people to London to join the welcome party. Uh, they have to, uh, I think surveillance is a secondary uh, and that surveillance is about other students. Probably they will have, they designate informants. Uh, they will ask them to report, submit periodic reports to their handlers and say, just tell us what's going on. So I think that is, but that's, that's the, so if that is the case, that means if you're on a given university, if you're on a university campus with a large or, uh, uh, organization uh, uh, sponsored by the Chinese government indirectly or directly uh, and that organization could be performing surveillance functions but that's geographically restricted they don't care for example Oxford right they don't care what's going on in Oxford per se <laughs> they care a lot a lot about what's going on among Chinese students at Oxford okay Next question I picked come from an anonymous participant. And the question is about the impact of the COVID pandemic. Has COVID-19 accelerated the surveillance state in China? Do you think that the Chinese citizens may be skeptical or they may lose trust in the government if they reintroduce an act? to track where people are, similar to what they did during the COVID yeah. lockdown? Yeah. I would say that if such an app, let me just answer the last question first. If the if such an app is introduced without a pandemic, probably a lot of people would, re would resist because it complicates people's lives needlessly. Uh, the white paper movement, happened, mostly because people thought that was too much, that was unnecessary, uh, that was counterproductive. Zero, zero COVID was imposed on China for far too long than it was needed. So I think that's, so if an app is sub introduced, so I think what probably has happened during the pandemic uh, is that the Chinese government learned that an app is very useful uh, uh, for tracking people, uh, mobile phone was far more useful than cameras because people are indoors, people are wearing masks. So what use uh, are those cameras with facial 
facial recognition capabilities. So uh, uh, the mobile phone, uh, uh, so as a tracking target, is uh, now sort of a, is far more important. Second, I think it's the, really the combination of labor and technology because to enforce zero COVID, you really cannot rely on tech alone. You rely on muscles. You rely on individuals. Uh, so grid management became a very important uh, organizational tool. So these are the two lessons probably the Chinese government learned during the pandemic. Next questions come from also an anonymous participant. Has China's economic slowdown in the last couple of years affected China's national security network or surveillance capacity? Oh, yes, definitely. I think uh, I've heard from a colleague who tracks local procurement uh, of security equipment. And that colleague said the procurement orders have declined a lot. <laughs> so because uh, the Chinese security apparatus is financed mostly by local budgets, 85% of spending on domestic security comes from local budgets. Uh, the slowdown has, especially the real estate crisis, has hit local government uh, finance really hard. So they have to save. And where do they save? Uh, I think the, the thing they can save most is on equipment spending because you don't have to upgrade uh, equipment. You, have, you don't have to, you can cut down on maintenance. So if I have to guess, I think, uh, we, of course, it's very hard to find real data, uh, but uh, based on the decline of orders, for public security, uh, uh, so for security equipment, uh, it's a safe bet that the system is being degraded, uh, or at least the upgrading is not taking place. <laughs> uh, so the, uh, the capabilities are not improving uh, in China. Another question from another anonymous participant. The participant, participant feels that China is now increasingly relying on technology rather than the mass spying network. If this is the case, why are they still keeping so many spies in the communities? Is this aimed at keeping people afraid of afraid from speaking? freely among themselves. If that is correct, does that mean China is taking a approach to surveillance that is different from other countries? Okay. Well, I think first I want to correct the, sort of the, uh, the premise of the question is that is China relying more on technologies and manpower? I think the correct things to say, the more correct thing to say is that China is relying more on technology than before, but does, this does not mean that it's a zero-sum game. It relies more on technology, so it relies less on um, manpower. I think it relies um, more on technology, uh, but it still relies a lot on manpower, largely because technology has a lot of blind spots. Uh, videos can only watch what you do in public. Uh, eavesdropping inside home can be quite difficult if you take precautions. So they have to rely on people who can watch you, who are close to you. Uh, so I, uh, I think it does not mean the party is more afraid of people now than before. The party is always afraid of people. <laughs> uh, it, uh, uh, so that's, uh, that's my answer. Okay, next question is a question for clarification of what you said. It comes from and in Washington, D.C. And what she would like to ask you is whether the people you refer to as key people in your key people's list are informants or are they subjects of surveillance? So key individuals are subjects of surveillance. Key individuals, not key people. 重点人员. 
They're different from Zhongdian Renko key populations. Both are subjects of surveillance. Thank you. Next question comes uh, from Carlos, who is having a second bite of the cherry. Can the development of the 5G networks trigger a new era of high-tech surveillance? I, it's really hard, I think, because uh, what one thing we can bet on is that if there's a technology, the Communist Party would like to use it. The Communist Party has this uh, sort of techno-utopian streak. It actually believes in the omnipotence of technology. The fancier the technology, the, the more appeal it has to the Chinese Communist Party. Whether the technology is suitable, whether uh, it can be effectively adopted, that's a different issue. So uh, you, you have sort of two-part answer is that China will embrace the technology, but whether that will uh, result in a new era of surveillance, that's unknown. I have to say that given the capabilities they have, probably they're not going to get much marginal benefits if they spend more on more technology. They already have a very capable system. I have to go in about two minutes. I have hard stop. I have to go and teach. Well, Ming Sing, I think this actually is a good time for me to draw it to a close so that you will not be missing your next appointment because we are less than two minutes from what your heart stopped will have to be. So let me draw this to a close and thank you very much for your very illuminating presentations and to thank the participants for their thoughtful questions. I hoped to see some of you in some of our physical seminars in the weeks to come.